few years ago, before DNA science joined forces with traditional genealogical investigations to shed light on our family roots, a technician who was working on my lawnmower told me that his family tree had been traced back to Charlemagne. Now, in case you didn't cover Charlemagne in your history class, Charles the Great, or Charlemagne, was the king of the Franks, a Germanic people who lived in what is today Belgium, France, Western Germany, and Luxembourg. He died in 814, around the ripe old age of 72. I was actually more surprised by the fact that he identified with the European ruler than I was by the certainty with which he made his bold declaration. In about 90% of the cases in which I've discussed family trees and genetic ancestry with people in Tennessee, Kentucky, Georgia, Arkansas, and certainly Oklahoma, I hear a pattern among claims. It goes something like this. I don't know where my folks came from, but I know my great-grandmother was a full-blooded Cherokee. She had them high cheekbones, and she could tan real easy. Well, folks, I've met a lot of Irish and French people, not to mention Italians and Greeks, who have those same features. Even among the English and Scots, there are people with dark hair and dark skin. Take a look at Catherine Zeta-Jones, Sean Connery, and Colin Farrell. They're Welsh, Scottish, and Irish, respectively. Today on The Vantage Point, I want to put some perspective on DNA and family histories because they often impact the identities that we attach to ourselves. I hope you'll join me. At the outset, I have to tell you, I have heard the same comments affirming Cherokee ancestry from my mother's and father's families. Either Chief James Van, who was assassinated in 1809, or his brother, Chief John Van, was my direct ancestor. A paper trail and DNA suggest that I'm carrying that line of Van Y chromosome. However, when I look at the results of autosomal tests, I only have a drop that's 1% of Cherokee ancestry. Nonetheless, my father strongly claimed that lineage. He would have been disappointed to know that he only had two drops of Cherokee DNA. By the way, Ancestry DNA shows that I am half Scottish, about 20% Irish, and 27% English and Northwestern European. So how could I have so little Cherokee DNA when I have the Y chromosome? Well, first of all, Y chromosomes are passed along the father's line while the chiefs were members of the Cherokee tribe, they were only half Cherokee. Our Y chromosome is a subclade of R1B1, which is the largest Y chromosome haplogroup in Western Europe. The chief's moms were Cherokee. Joseph Van, their father, was a Scottish trader and interpreter for the British government and anyone else who was willing to pay for his linguistic services. The rest of the reason for my low showing of Native American autosomal DNA is due to the number of generations that the DNA would have had to pass through on its way to me. James Van was my fourth great-grandfather. That's five generations before me. If I inherited DNA equally throughout those generations, I would be carrying 0.78% of his DNA. That's not much. The lawnmower technician, if he was a direct male descendant of Charlemagne, would have his Y chromosome, which probably would have mutated by now. Looking into our deep ancestry, there is some debate among scholars working in historical demography and historical geography, as well as archaeology, about the numbers of people alive at the time of the agricultural revolution and the birth of the Neolithic Age, or the New Stone Age. While I think that there were many hearths for agricultural revolutions around the world, not the least of which the Americas, and even Ireland, the big revolution occurred in the Middle East around 8000 BC. There certainly were no census officials working in bureaucratic offices or pounding the pavement going door to door at 8000 BCE. Nope. An estimate based on reverse growth models estimates that the human population at the outset of the big one was between 4 and 5 million people. One way to see how important that number is to each of us is to consider how our own family trees and our deep ancestry relate to it. While communication technology may seem to make the world smaller, the numbers of people living in past times, especially those around the time of the agricultural revolution, suggest that their world was sparsely populated. By using a four generations per century approach, we can calculate that a child born in 2010, like my granddaughter Zoe, my first grandbaby, 
would have 16 great-great-grandparents living in 1910. Zoe would have 4,134,000 ancestors alive in 1451, the year of Christopher Columbus's birth. It takes only a little thought to realize that at some point in each person's family tree, relatives married or otherwise mated with kinfolk, and they weren't even from Arkansas. The notion that each person is a product of a, as a family tree that expands outward along many branches must be challenged because at some point in the past, the tree analogy no longer accurately describes familial connections, let alone the fantastic numbers of people needed to make it to be a realistic depiction of our collective deep ancestry. In reality, ancestries resemble an inverted pyramid with another pyramid stacked on top of it, base to base. The family tree analogy is a rather short-sighted perception of ancestral connections, but it seems to work well for folks interested in genealogy who are seldom able to go back past five or six generations. Now, that's really put things into perspective. With the stacked and opposing pyramids in mind, the top pyramid represents each person's deep ancestry, converging on a Y chromosome atom and a mitochondrial DNA uh, Eve. Now, how else would a child born in 2010 have 8,388,000 ancestors alive in 1435? That's twice the number of people living at the time of the agricultural revolution, only 9,500 years earlier. Well, I hope you found these perspectives on DNA and ancestry research interesting. Thanks for joining me, and I look forward to seeing you next time here on The Vantage Point.